and welcome back to the channel. I hope that everybody is doing well today. If you're new here, then hi, my name is Brittany and I'm a nurse practitioner. And I'm also the creator of the Brittany Holzbeck NP Review. It is the most comprehensive and affordable nurse practitioner boards review course on the market. And it is tailored to the AANP and the ANCC exams. It's also accredited through the AANP, meaning that if you complete the course, you can get a little bit over 17 continuing education credits. And the really cool thing about that is, is that you don't actually need to be a nurse practitioner student prepping for your boards. You could be a nursing student, a established nurse, NP student, or an established nurse practitioner in the need of continuing education credits. And so you could take that course as well to collect those CEUs. We know that we all need them to maintain our licensure. So the entire course is available on my Patreon. I'll have the link in the description box below. Make sure that you read each tier before you purchase. There are four different tiers available, two of which are the board's review. There is one $40 tier and there's another $60 tier. Both of them have the exact same content, but it is the $60 tier that is eligible for CEUs. The $40 tier, again, like I said, it's the exact same review course, but that one is not eligible for CEUs. So just make sure you read the description before you purchase anything. But yeah, everything will be linked in the description box below. Check it out if you are studying or if you're in need of CEUs. So for today's video, I am going to be doing something similar to the last video I did. If you saw the last video, I covered 10 drug classes that you need to know for your boards. And a lot of people really liked it as like a study tool going into their licensing exam. I accidentally only did nine medication classes. I skipped one on accident. So my apologies, a couple of you noticed that and I apologize. And so for today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to discuss five specific medications that you absolutely need to know for your boards. And this is going to be part one of a series. I have a lot of medications that we should go over with like hot topics little buzzwords or hot topics that you could definitely see on the licensing exam. And then in today's video, I'll have a bonus drug class that you need to know, the one that I skipped in my last video. Again, I'm sorry, I'm human. So let's just go ahead and get into the content. But before we do, do me a little favor if you could, go ahead and like the video and subscribe to the channel. It's a free way to help me out and support the channel. I really appreciate it. Okay, so our first medication that we're going to be talking about today is lithium. So lithium is still a mainstay treatment for bipolar, especially in mania or for maintenance treatment of bipolar. And the reason that you want to be familiar with this medication is because it has a narrow therapeutic index. And so what this means is that the dose of which the lithium is clinically effective for treating said disorder bipolar, it is only slightly lower than what is considered a toxic level. And so medications that have that narrow therapeutic index are definitely going to be worth being familiar because of the safety issue there. We have, there's a big risk of safety and toxic levels. And so lithium, like I said, that's one of those drugs that has a narrow therapeutic index. And so what we're looking for as far as clinically effective levels would be between 0.8 and 1.2. Therefore, we don't want their lithium levels to go above 1.2. And there are a couple of things that you should be familiar with that can increase a person's lithium level. One being dehydration. We've seen this to be a risk factor for increasing lithium. And then also increase of sodium intake. That's also been linked with increasing lithium levels. And so a couple of things that you definitely want to be familiar with. So what are symptoms of lithium toxicity? So first, they start out with GI symptoms, kind of these nonspecific nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and then later on, they can manifest neurological symptoms, such as ataxia, confusion, sluggishness, clonus, excitability, those neurological symptoms usually don't come until later on in the course. And that's why it's always so important when a patient is presenting to you with any kind of complaint, even those non-specific GI complaints that we're looking at their medication list and what they're on. And if we see that they're on lithium, then that might be something that we wanna have on our differential of potentially lithium, lithium toxicity and we'd wanna get a lithium level. All right, so the next medication that you want to be familiar with would be digoxin. So digoxin is sometimes still used in 
heart failure. And again, it's another one of those medicines that has a very narrow therapeutic index, meaning that the dose that's clinically effective is only slightly lower than the toxic dose. And so the range that we're looking for with digoxin is 0.5 to 0.8. And so symptoms of digoxin toxicity, again, they generally start with these nonspecific symptoms, such as nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, anorexia, loss of appetite. Again, why we always are looking at their medication list. It's so important to know what medications our patient is taking. And then later on in the course, they can also develop these neurological symptoms such as confusion but a big difference with digoxin is they can also develop these visual changes so they can see a yellow hue these color variations these color changes often reported as a yellow a yellowish color and also halos they can see halos sometimes they can even develop blind spots or even just blindness and so with digoxin toxicity we want to have that on our radar that they can later on in the course develop these visual changes. All right, next medication that you definitely want to be familiar with would be warfarin. So warfarin is a vitamin K antagonist. It's used in heart failure, atrial fibrillation, thrombotic events, antiphospholipid disorder, acute coronary syndrome, and patients that have a mechanical heart valve. Again, it's another one with a narrow therapeutic index, and so really it's not the preferred choice for most of those indications. Generally, we're using now direct oral anticoagulants. However, in the case of antiphospholipid syndrome and in patients that have mechanical heart valve, this is still the preferred agent. Like I said, warfarin is a vitamin K antagonist, but it is important to know that the patient is allowed to have vitamin K in their diet, and what's been associated with fluctuating their level of warfarin would be changes in their vitamin K intake. So not necessarily them eating vitamin K, but changing the intake of their vitamin K can change their levels. So warfarin is measured using the PT and INR. With warfarin, the desired INR is between 2.0 and 3.0. However, if the patient is at a greater risk for clotting, then we want a higher INR. So for example, patients that have a prosthetic heart valve, we want their INR between 2.5 and 3.5. And so what this means is that the higher INR indicates the longer amount of time it takes for that patient to clot. So the higher the dose of the warfarin, the longer it takes for them to clot. And then in the circumstance of bleeding with our patients, if it's life-threatening or severe bleeding, of course we're stopping the warfarin, but we can also administer vitamin K intravenously to treat the bleeding. Okay, so that next medication that you absolutely need to know would be for Motorol. So for Motorol is considered a fast-acting long-acting beta agonist. And so these updated GINA guidelines says that for Motorol, in combination with an inhaled corticosteroid is first-line treatment for asthma. It's really important though that you understand that for Motorol needs to be combined with an, a low-dose inhaled corticosteroid. For Motorol as a monotherapy, so by itself, has been associated with increase in exacerbations, increase in hospitalizations. It is not intended to be monotherapy, but it has to be combined with an inhaled corticosteroid. So another important point is that beta agonists should not be combined with non-selective beta blockers. They're considered a category X when combining the drugs, meaning that you do not do it no combining beta agonists with non-selective beta blockers. And that's because the non-selective beta blockers can actually diminish the bronchodilating effect of the beta agonists. And so examples of non-selective beta blockers would be labetalol, propanolol, and carvedilol. And so that's just really important. I did want to mention, yes, the Global Initiative for Asthma has said that the combination of formoterol with the inhaled corticosteroid is first line treatment for asthma. However, I was you know just researching um, up to date and they do state that in patients that have a low risk of exacerbation with very intermittent symptoms of asthma, uh, short acting beta agonists such as albuterol is still an appropriate choice. 
Um, these drugs have been around for a very long time and they are much more affordable. So it kind of just depends on the patient and their you know preference, their availability, what they can afford, their symptoms. Uh, definitely your boards is going to want to see that you know the GINA guidelines, so do be familiar with them. But that being said, it is important to know that in practice, if they have low risk for exacerbation and it's just intermittent symptoms, we often still do use albuterol in practice. And so it is good to know risks for exacerbations. So for example, if they've had exacerbation more than one in the past year, if they have obesity, if they have concurrent COPD, if they have various IgE food allergies, if they are pregnant, these are just some risk factors for having asthma exacerbations, in which case you would not want to be using albuterol in practice but um, just something to be on the radar for when you're actually in practice. You know, there's always going to be some differences in the real world versus what your board wants, but your board definitely wants to know that you are familiar with the updated GINA guidelines. Okay, so the next medication that you definitely need to know for your boards is going to be levothyroxine. So we know that levothyroxine is first-line treatment for hypothyroidism. It is synthetic T4. It's really important to know that the initial dosing with this drug can be started at the intended full dose unless the patient has a history of cardiovascular disease or if they're 60 years old or older. Then we wanna start them at a very low dose and slowly titrate with levothyroxine. These at-risk groups, those cardiac disease and the elderly 16 and above, we wanna start at like 25 to 50 micrograms a day and then slowly titrate. This is because potentially life-threatening cardiovascular effects can occur with the initiation of levothyroxine. Again, especially in those patients with the history of cardiovascular disease or a history of arrhythmias. So like I said, we start them at that low dose of 25 to 50 mics, and then we check their TSH in about four to six weeks to see where their level is at, and then titrate as needed. But again, with those populations, we want to go low and slow to minimize the risk of any kind of cardiovascular effects. It's also important to note that T4, the levothyroxine, should be taken on an empty stomach with a glass of water. Preferably, they say you should take this medication in the morning, at least 30 to 60 minutes before breakfast. However, there are some people that prefer to take it at night, but you should take it at least two hours after having your dinner. All right, and so like I said, that bonus drug class, the one that I skipped in my last video, is going to be NSAIDs. And that's non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. There are more than 20 available on the market. They're so commonly used. They're used for their analgesic effects, their antipyretic effects, their anti-inflammatory effects. And there are some things that you definitely wanna be familiar with before you go to take your boards regarding NSAIDs. So one being aspirin. Aspirin is an NSAID. It's important to know that low-dose aspirin is used for its anti-platelet effects. So for example, that 81 milligram dose of aspirin in comparison to the higher doses, those are used for the antipyretic and analgesic effects. And finally, it's important to consider NSAID use and patient risk factors or comorbidities. So one big one that you wanna be familiar with would be patients that have either peptic ulcer disease or if they are 60 years old or older because they're at risk for different GI disorders. We really want to either avoid NSAID use with this patient population, so instead we could use acetaminophen. If they need to be on NSAIDs, then of course we want the shortest amount of time with the lowest dose possible, and it's a good idea to combine that with a proton pump inhibitor to help protect their gastrointestinal tract, so something like omeprazole, in combination with that short-term use of NSAIDs. Another big one is that actually NSAID use is associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular events, whether or not they have a history of cardiovascular disease. However, the absolute risk is dependent on the patient's baseline of cardiovascular disease and risk factors. So risk factors include a history of cardiovascular events, male gender, hypertension, older age, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, history of smoking, all of these are going to increase a person's risk factor for having a cardiovascular event or developing cardiovascular disease. And so again, if we can, we really want to avoid NSAID use in these patient populations. So instead, acetaminophen would be the preferred choice again, but if they need an NSAID, again, shortest duration, 
lowest dose possible. Naproxen and Selexcoxib, I hope I'm saying that correctly, are the preferred choices if they do need an NSAID. Lastly, there is an increased risk for kidney disease or kidney injury with the use of NSAIDs, especially in those patients that already have established kidney disease. Also in those patients that have heart failure, cirrhosis, or if they are on diuretics, and they are also at an increased risk for kidney injury. And as a general rule, NSAIDs should be avoided in patients that have either stage four or stage five chronic kidney disease. And so really there's a lot of risk factors and comorbidities that we need to be checking for in our patients before prescribing NSAIDs. And it's, it seems so harmless because they are so readily available over the counter, but really there are some risk factors that come with NSAIDs. And so when you're on your boards, definitely make sure that you're paying attention before prescribing NSAIDs in your patient's history, risk factors. And you know, a lot of times acetaminophen is going to be a preferred choice over NSAIDs, especially on your boards something that you want to be looking out for. Or even non-pharmacological interventions like heat, ice, rest, stretching, stuff like that to avoid NSAID use. Definitely something, again, you want to be familiar with before you go take your boards. All right, well, I think that is going to be all for today's video. Hopefully you found it helpful. If you did, don't forget to like and subscribe. I really do appreciate it. Again, if you're interested in my review course, I'll have everything that you need to sign up in the description box below. Definitely go check it out. Make sure though that you do read the tiers before purchasing. If you have any questions or comments, leave them in the comment section down below. Otherwise, I wish you guys nothing but the best. Don't forget to learn something new every day and I'll talk to you soon. Bye guys. Thank you.